there. All right, and go back. To, okay. All right. So this is just uh, an introduction to the kind of work that I do. Uh, I call myself historian and geographer, but I earn a living by drawing maps. And uh, about a third of my work is of Chicago. Otherwise, it's a widely disparate um, set of clients in real estate, in tourism, and in publishing, uh, and also in public transit. So I'm the designer of the Chicago Transit Authority map. Uh, I don't have that contract at the moment, but I do the RTA's regional map. And um, it, uh, just a, a wide variety of stuff, and I really enjoy it. Uh, these days, maybe a quarter of my work is historic maps for publications in either academic press books or uh, rail fan books and magazines. The, uh, railroad buffs, especially the traction fans that are interested in electric railroads, streetcars, interurbans, uh, are among the folks that still pay for publications and therefore still can afford to pay contributors to publications. <laughs> but as a side hobby, um, I began uh, building a little website, uh, oh, I don't know, a decade ago or more, where I would uh, put the things that I had found as I was looking for historic resources for my Chicago work uh, to help others Chicago history buffs, genealogists, researchers, to find things that are scattered around the web. In those days, sometimes it was tricky to find things, but that were showing up in unexpected places. One of the larger collections of 19th century atlas uh, scans is at the University of Alabama Library because of an alum who happened to give some money and some scans to them. But you would never think to look there for Chicago uh, city plans or for the USGS maps that for a while were most easily available through Texas A&M University, uh, other things that are scattered around Boston Public Library, of course the famous David Rumsey collection that's now connected with Stanford, uh, but there are things coast to coast and even around the world, uh, whether it's the National Library of Scotland or the American Geographical Society at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, that are real treasure troves for Chicago materials unexpected. So it's a very basic website that I just hand coded uh, with some sections, some, uh, sources and links, and then uh, direct links to some uh, sorted by year. A few things that I put together for fun uh, that are current maps. So things like map of the Pedway, map of the places that are uh, called out by name in tra Chicago traffic reports, things like that. <laughs> uh, some links to some uh, collections of thematic maps, whether it's historic transit maps or other things that are pretty specialized. But today I was asked to talk about the uh, fire insurance maps in particular, and the largest publisher of those fire insurance maps is Sanborn Company, and certainly not the only one. That's an important distinction to keep in mind as we look for fire insurance maps. But to make that uh, easier, especially until recently, the process for getting to these, which uh, were on the uh, Chicago Public Library's website, a subscription to a commercial service called ProQuest, was very tedious. The user interface was really like uh, walking uphill through deep snow to finally get to the exact page that you wanted. And so I decided first to put together a finding aid to it. And then I realized, well, you know, I could make that click through directly to the volume number, especially once the uh, Library of Congress began posting its scanned color editions of these online. Now I could directly link to those. So that's what you see here. Any place that you see a year, that's a clickable link to the library that is holding that and posting it online. So on here are ones at uh, the uh, Library of Congress, of course, at Northwestern, those are the ones in purple, uh, and in blue and gold, the ones at University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. I have recently become aware that there are uh, a few others that are available through um, 
a, a commercial website, and also I'll, I'll be adding a few more links uh, to that as well. I think I also, since I need this slide, uh, uh, some from Boston Public that turned out to be pretty important. So what are we talking about when we talk about fire insurance maps? Fire, as we uh, commemorated in October, the 150th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire, was uh, a great peril to the 19th century city. And so to make uh, fire insurance underwriting more practical for remote insurance companies, uh, these uh, entrepreneurs, sometimes they only uh, survived one edition a decade or less, but sometimes they built great companies out of this, doing this, like the Sanborn uh, company that eventually comes to be located in Pelham, New York, just north of the Bronx. And uh, so fire insurance maps would map out the basic footprint of every building in a built up urban area and color code it as to whether it is frame, those are the straw colored, or uh, masonry, that's what you see in ink, is uh, brick or stone. Uh, sometimes there are more elaborate color codings for metal fronts, cornices that are pressed metal or steel, things uh, like that, cast iron. Uh, but anything that's going to affect how flammable a building is and how quickly fire can spread there are the kinds of notes that we find on these fire insurance maps from the 19th and early 20th century. So here is a portion of um, what is now the University of Illinois at Chicago campus showing the diagonal that no, no longer exists, Blue Island Avenue uh, coming up to the corner of Harrison and Halston. So uh, this is uh, 1886, so I don't even think there's yet a Hall House uh, that would be down in this area. So start growing a complex there from a, a mansion that uh, is already on the, on the site uh, sometime in the 18th or 18th. And so these are fascinating to study for the little Chicago history stories that they tell. Uh, so for instance, if you look at the 1886 ones, which are online through the Encyclopedia of Chicago, You'll see up in the Gold Coast a particular mansion here, on the south side of which it says Glass House. And that is the Potter Palmer Mansion with the conservatory that Mrs. Paul Bertha Palmer uh, had built on the south side, with all of that spring sunshine for the flowers and plants that she's growing in there. Um, this uh, we are up in uh, the Old Town neighborhood. And so this was a slide that I used for a Chicago fire talk I gave in December, uh, talking about the aftermath of the Great Chicago Fire when the city Common Council put in place limits on the construction of wooden buildings. But the Germans of 19th century Chicago had the clout to get Old Town, their neighborhood, exempted from the new fire uh, limit requirements. And so we see in 1886, uh, so a decade and a half after the fire, lots of wooden buildings that have been built in what the neighborhood that we today call Old Town on the near side. Um, the suburbs are sometimes covered as well, but because fire insurance maps uh, kind of sputtered out in the 1950s for uh, reasons we can speculate on. Uh, uh, they don't show the tremendous post-war growth of the suburbs. And so mostly what you see in maps of, here's a section of Arlington Heights, is the stuff that was built prior to World War II. Yes, those are the last maps that exist in the directions. Those of you here in the room, please interrupt me anytime you want to uh, ask about uh, specifics. Otherwise, I'll race through these and go to talk about where we want to. Um, I did a talk for Northwest Genealogical Society uh, a few months ago. And so I uh, just, as a point of interest to them, tracked down the Methodist campground that was in this plains. And so these are all wooden cottages built in a, a sort of a Chautauqua or a, a, a 
summer campground uh, thing that they had there on the banks of the Desplaines River, uh, but very, uh, on a very close walk from the Desplaines Railroad Station, because that's, of course, how you would go out there from the city. So, as I mentioned, Library of Congress uh, has been scanning, hired a contractor to scan virtually all the ones that they have that were deposited with them as copyright deposits. Uh, federal law always required that if you wanted a copyright uh, registration, you had to send a copy of your book to the Library of Congress. And this, of course, ensured that it was an institution unparalleled in its holdings. And among the things that they ended up with were the originally uh, originals of so many of these uh, fire insurance volumes as they were published. Now the fire insurance volumes got, uh, the way you got corrections for them was they would send you a sheet full of things for you to cut out with your shears and use a paste pot. And they would tell you what page to paste this in place of what was there before, because these were big volumes, uh, 80 centimeters by uh, 100 centimeters. And, uh, and so the, the companies that leased these volumes, whether they were fire insurance companies or public utilities or others that uh, were subscribers, would have uh, you know, kids working for the summer, pasting in the corrections that they'd been sent by the Sandboard company since the last time they updated the volumes. And uh, you can find them, of course, by going to the Library of Congress website. Uh, another search engine that I use a lot for mapping materials is DPLA, Digital Public Library of America.org. And I have that up in a, a, a prime position on my Chicago and Maps page. If, uh, so that's a way to jump to it. I think it's dpla.org. And uh, once you get to the proper volume uh, that's held by, say, let's say, the Library of Congress, but it could also be the U of I, Champagne, you'll find that the first page is usually this index page where you zoom in and look at the, uh, the street names, some of which may actually have corrections pasted on top of them as the names of the streets changed. Um, and figure out which page it is that you want to look at. And you know, then there's a navigation bar where you can jump to that page. Typically, the index will be only be one page. And so you go, oh, I want to see uh, map 60. That's going to be on page 61. And you can take a guess. Uh, so you'll be within one or two of where it actually is. On the line. Now, Sanborn maps have uh, the first level of them is kind of understandable at first glance, but there are details that need to study the key to really uh, get into. So the way that they signify where there were window openings and on which stories is uh, a unique symbolization scheme. There, of course, were all these different colors and perimeter colors that they used to show the materials that the buildings were made of, uh, all kinds of other symbols, uh, kinds of chimneys that you would find. But there's also a lot of notes that are completely understandable. Uh, if they drew the sketch of the building plans, they will tell you that. Uh, notes about particularly dangerous activities that were carried on within the buildings, um, notes about whether there are automatic fire alarms, where there are fire alarm boxes located, where there are fire hydrants, whether there's a night watchman, and uh, the rounds that he has to make, uh, a PTEX station that he has to visit within a big factory complex so that he would know Hey, something that is broken, a fire is broken out in the Cooperage bar before he sniffs it from uh, his, uh, his spot in the office tower. So there are uh, all kinds of fun little Chicago stories that you stumble upon as you uh, look up things in here. Uh, just last week, I discovered that 
in uh, Bridgeport. Chicago once had a fake street, <laughs> <laughs> which sounds like a gag from the Simpsons episode, but I looked it up in the uh, street name index cards, which I'm slowly digitizing uh, as another project that will enhance Chicago maps. And sure enough, uh, in 1902, they changed Fake Street to Lloyd Abbott. Dennis, before you go on, can you say just a couple more words about the uh, street name in this? The street name in this. <laughs> this is something I've heard about. Yeah. Okay. So one of the links from chicagoinmaps.org is to a TypeScript that uh, someone, and I we think we might know his name, uh, put together of Chicago street name changes uh, that is in Chicago History Museum. And that is now available online through Your House Has a History. But that TypeScript is incomplete and does not tell you when the name was changed. Plus, a lot of Chicago street names were changed only for a section of the street or changed multiple times, things that would be really valuable for genealogists to know. And so the Department of Maps, Bureau of Maps and Plats in the Departments of uh, Streets and Sanitation used to have an index file of all these changes. From the typography, it looks to me like it was compiled probably in the late 60s, early 70s by whoever was uh, in charge then. And eventually they photocopied this, bound the photocopies into four volumes that are behind the reference desk at the Municipal Reference Collection, Harold Washington Libraries. Since this is not a copyrighted uh, volume, I've been going over uh, nights and weekends and uh, doing one letter at a time. I'm up through uh, J at the moment. And uh, you know, this time next year should have the entire Thing as a PDF that you can uh, uh, search, not not so not mechanically search, but as a PDF that you can look at, and I'll post that online and probably put it also on archive.org so that it's discoverable by others. Uh, very easily. If anybody who wants to volunteer to help me with this project. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that. <laughs> All right. Um, here's another thing that just came up on Twitter about two weeks ago. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what we today call Polish Triangle at Division Milwaukee and Ashland. And uh, it turns out it used to have a multi story building there. And so, wait, so I went back and looked up in the fire insurance maps, and sure enough, not only there it is with the number of stories, uh, which I'm talking about here, four plus a basement, but they even give us immediately the name of the occupant. Uh, actually, the owner, as it turns out, of this triangular building was Clee Brothers and Company, a cloth clothier, and their ground floor was a big clothing store. And then there's a note here that says hotel on two, three, and four. How many stars for that hotel? <laughs> but anyway, interesting information. Um, the reason that these were so valuable that a private company saved and microfilmed them in the 70s and 80s was for the information they offer on previous uses that might have left traces. So Superfund sites, uh, if you're trying to figure out if you've got heavy metals, and you go and look at the fire insurance map and you see, oh, there was a plating works there in the teens, chances are you've got a, a soil contamination problem, heavy metals that uh, were left behind when that operation closed. So this is down in what we today call Pilsen. Here's a manganese shop for, uh, I think they were making kind of appliances that go on railroad tracks, like uh, what we call frogs, and switches, things like that. And uh, hang the knees. That might be worth uh, looking into further if you're if you're planning to develop residential uh, in this part of Pilsen. Before we leave that slide, can you just comment about sort of the? It, it seems like this is an example where some corrections have been made. Indeed, and I've tried to include a couple of these uh, where you can actually see that uh, things have been pasted in. Uh, 
Uh, so what happened here? Uh, probably division of a large parcel into multiple ones. Uh, maybe there's a building we can't quite see. A little further back from Blue Island Avenue. And others we just kind of have to guess about. Here we can see previous notes about that company that have been pasted over with new details. Maybe it was sold to a new corporate owner, uh, changed the manufacturing rather than the whole um, I think it is more common than not for the ones at Library of Congress to not have much in the way of corrections because those were typically deposited first. And I don't know what the, the policy was for using the update sheets, if Library of Congress also pasted things in or not. <clears throat> but other surviving copies of these uh, books uh, frequently do have visible corrections. Here's Bubbling Creek. Most of you will know uh, something about Bubbling Creek and where it gets its name. But the armor blue works <laughs> adjacent to it probably were responsible for discharging a certain amount of organic material into <laughs> the south branch, south fork of the south branch of the Chicago River. And uh, there's actually housing built, housing built on that site uh, today as Bridgeport has become entirely residential. <clears throat> but you can imagine the, uh, the smell that uh, the armor blue works. And, and uh, sorry to interrupt, the dashed lines here, are these former streets, former uh, lots that have been kind of gobbled up by the industrial development? So here is a street that has been vacated. Uh, and that's what these dash lines. Here, uh, it is a replat, uh, chances are. Now, relatively, it's, it's fairly uncommon to see that level of property detail in the true Sanborn fire insurance maps. But this is actually from a uh, Greeley Carlson and Company atlas, which was more of a cadastral map combined with information about the buildings on most of the properties. And uh, so it's a combination of cadastral and um, uh, built environment map, I guess I could say. I mean, it doesn't obviously doesn't have the detail about watchmen, fire hydrants, things like that in there, but it certainly distinguishes or seems to between different building materials and also then has the uh, astral biogenic property ownership or property registration information. And who's the publisher? This one is Greeley Carlson and Company, 1894, as I recall. Here is what we looked at for many decades before we began scanning the color copies. These are my things that were microfilmed in the 1970s, and then the originals frequently discarded. So it's all we have for some volumes, uh, but this is, uh, where am I? Uh, oh, I'm in downtown Florida. I was working on a project for um, uh, First and Fastest Magazine uh, about uh, streetcars and, and, and interurbans that ran in uh, Florida. And so being able to figure out the detail of industrial trackage going in some cases into these buildings along the riverfront there uh, on the Illinois River in uh, downtown Florida. All right, how do you get to them? Well, uh, we've already kind of described uh, this, that uh, you start at Chicago in maps and uh, go to the finding aid and uh, you click on these various numbers. If uh, it's in green, uh, well, kind of out of luck. You have to instead click uh, here, and that will take you to the Chicago Public Library login, where you have to put in your card number and your PIN, which is typically your zip code, unless you have changed it. But it at least saves you a couple of steps in getting to the right volume. And then that, uh, Chicago Public Library, Digital Sandboard Maps, this 
interface has recently changed. It's uh, somewhat easier than it used to be, but uh, pay attention that you can choose virtually any city in Illinois. You never realize how many tiny cities there are. <laughs> so you're scrolling your way down to find Chicago, or just type of CH and then jump to it. Um, but also pay attention that you're choosing uh, among the dates that they have available, and that can be a little confusing until you work with these very much, and then choose the right volume that you want to see, which you should remember from the finding aid, which if you forgot, uh, I made this open up a new tab, so you always can uh, just look back at the tab. Uh, there's also, as it happens, this is the company that digitized a lot of the stuff for the Library of Congress. But Historical Information Gatherers um, has a portal called Fire Insurance Maps Online, which Chicago Public Library subscribes to, but of course, separately from the ProQuest subscription. So you look at Chicago Public Library's historic resources, and there are two things that you click through to. One is Sanborn Maps Online through ProQuest, but the other is uh, Fire Insurance Maps Online. And Fire Insurance Maps Online not only has a way to, uh, to jump to, and they only subscribe to Illinois, but other libraries may choose to have other parts of this uh, huge data set. Anyway, you can either do it by place name or you can click on a spot and uh, that will show you in the sidebar all of the maps and atlases that are available for that spot. So uh, using that, I managed to uh, look down at uh, Hyde Park in 1890. So Hyde Park, you know, that didn't come into the city of Chicago until 1889. And this 1890 volume of Hyde Park um, still is separate from Chicago. And so here is the U of C campus as it looked in 1890, a couple of years before the current institution was actually founded. But there are already some brick row houses over here on Dorchester, as well as a few here on uh, 57. And um, if the rain holds up, I'm gonna walk up that, uh, that way this afternoon and see if any of these survive. Here is Hyde Park High School. It is currently the site of Ray School's uh, playground. So stayed with the board of ed. All right, uh, just a few use cases uh, that maybe will whet your appetite. When I was working on uh, maps for uh, Carl Smith's book about the Great Chicago Fire, which came out a, a year ago last October, uh, I discovered that the Leventhal Center at uh, Boston Public had a complete set of these 1868 and 9 maps of Chicago. Only the colored areas are mapped. So the great bulk of uh, ordinary working people's houses, which already existed, including obviously the area where the fire uh, started out here, are not mapped. So we can't actually look at the details of Mrs. O'Leary's backyard, but we can see details of things like Crosby's Opera House and uh, you know, downtown and uh, figure out how to show the footprint of that building, which otherwise we just kind of have to guess at. And when you're doing historical cartography for someone and they say, uh, and you say, well, where should I put this on the map? They say, oh, Ververtal Ver 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 was at the corner of 18th and Austin. Well, I need to know which quarter of 18th and Halstead because I'm going to be showing both those streets on, on the base map. Uh, anyway, so the tricks, uh, that's a whole other talk about during the story. Um, here's another old Chicago story from my neighborhood. I live right here, right behind Dearborn Station in the high rise, or the high rises of Dearborn Park. And these round buildings over here at what we today call Balbo and Wabash. Um, those were panorama paintings. You went through a little short hallway and up a stair and found yourself surrounded by a cyclorama or panorama of something like uh, Jerusalem, the morning of the crucifixion, or uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, or the 
was also a cyclorama of the Great Chicago Fire that was displayed for a while, and that one is now online uh, through the Chicago History Museum. Do you know what year this is with the Carolines? This is 1886, Robbins. Okay, pretty sure. I know, I should have put that in the corner, but. <laughs> <laughs> so here, um, here's one I had fun with uh, just uh, uh, about three weeks ago. Leslie Martin at Chicago History Museum emails me when she gets uh, puzzles, uh, mystery photos that the public has have sent in. In this case, the public was the archives of Monaco. who said, uh, Prince Albert uh, took <laughs> took a trip to Chicago in 1913 and made these photographs. Where are they now? Wow. And so she sends me, um, among the others, this one. Well, all right, there's an L train. Okay, that's a pretty good guess, but it could be one of three different locations where it's, a, where it's a corner rather than a T uh, coming off through the L. And uh, so anyway, eventually I uh, decided, you know, I believe that is Harrison and Wabash, where it's uh, the L, Southside L is shifting out of the alley and over to run over the top of Wabash there, Harrison. And I know how I can confirm it. Four, 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 four stories, followed by three, 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 four, 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 four. four. Yes, it lines up. <laughs> so here's valuable information gleaned from the fire insurance maps that help me to uh, you know, be satisfied that I have solved a mystery location. As it turns out, we do have, these are in the Newberry, not yet digitized. Uh, we do have fire insurance maps of the 1893 World's Just Exposition. <laughs> And uh, one of the things that you can see on here is that none of the buildings are fireproof. They are all built of wooden uh, structural members, even the fisheries building, the women's building, the Illinois Pavilion, except for one up there, the, which has a brick uh, structure underneath the plaster of Paris and jute that they slathered on the outside into ornaments. And that was because there were all these priceless works of art inside. In the Palace of Fine Arts at the International Columbia Exposition. And it looks like this inside. And many of you know the story that it eventually fell into ruins and was essentially completely rebuilt, but with the same outside shape in the early 1930s to become the Museum of Science. Uh, but these fire insurance maps are among the things that the group at UCLA has been able to use to reconstruct the World's Columbian Exposition as a kind of a walk-through thing and fly through space that they need to get to video. So the project of some of the others. Well, what's the other thing uh, people will always ask about when you talk about the World's Columbian Exposition? Devil in the White City. Where, did, where was H.H. H. Holmes's murder hotel? Well, there are significant questions about the exact number of murders that he committed there. And, and Eric Larson is more of a, a storyteller than a historian, it turns out. But um, here is the hotel in an 1895 fire insurance map, corner of 63rd and Waltz. You see the stores, that's designated by the S on the ground floor. We also have fire insurance maps of the 1933-34 century of progress. So here's probably the most detailed plans that we still have of things like the Hall of Science and the general exhibits group down here. Uh, here's some sense of what it looked like. It's painted masonite uh, with my spot on searchlights. Here's how I use these. These are some Brompton maps. Uh, these are not so much fire insurance, but they are uh, very detailed building footprint maps. And then also show things like the streetcar or trolley lines, they would say, in Austin. And I use these to recreate uh, space that no longer exists. 
present since the early 1960s, and that is Scully Square. Scully Square was a low rent entertainment of the less district of Boston, and a professor somewhere was writing a book about the, the servicemen who got into trouble there during World War II. Back. Here's one I did for a book that uh, Northwestern just put out about Cincinnati. And we're showing the industrial land uses down uh, in the Deer Creek Valley in the early 20th century, reconstructed from these fire insurance maps, block by block. I found uh, the Scott Newman. Who studied at Loyola and now teaches at Walden University. I didn't know Walden was a real institution. I thought it was uh, something in Doonesbury comics. Here. But anyway, Walden University apparently exists, and Scott Newman, <laughs> uh, as a young faculty member, found his position there. But while he was in Chicago, he painstakingly redrew as PDFs all the bright light districts of Jazz Age Chicago. Incredible thing that disappeared from the internet for a few years, but uh, he put back up as a WordPress site. So Jazzy in Chicago makes it easy to find. Uh, University of uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee has a tremendous map collection because they got the American Geographical Society's collection in the early 80s. And um, so they have a site that points to fire insurance maps at institutions all across the country. So if you're doing work in other cities, this is a valuable guide to finding some of those things in other uh, libraries, archives. Uh, University of Michigan has a similar one, but I don't seem to be as helpful. Um, so I, I will kind of wind up there by reminding you yet again, Chicago in maps is a place to start when you're looking for specific uh, map related stuff having to do with Chicago. And uh, I'm, of course, happy to help you in any way that I can. Uh, I have my email address up here at the top. I absolutely welcome emails from people about Chicago history. Don't be shy at all about that. Uh, the website I mentioned several times, chicagomaps.com. Not knowing who the audience would be here today, but I'll tell you the address for Chicago Public Library. Um, a lot of maps that I made for the Encyclopedia of Chicago, or all the maps I made for the Encyclopedia, are hosted at that website. And for a while, Chicago History Museum was using that as a portal to post things that they were scanning. I don't know if that's still an active program. And finally, and uh, I'm sure you're going to cheer, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there is a Chicago Map Society, which meets monthly except the summers at the Newberry Library. We hope to return to uh, uh, in person uh, meetings soon. If you are a map, that kind of map geek that just can't get enough of, of this kind of stuff. Uh, Professor Michael Conzen, some of you know him. He's, I think, emeritus now, but uh, maybe still running the, the geography program, uh, whatever that has kind of dissolved into these days. Right? It's being absorbed by uh, actually the department that you're sitting in. Department. Okay. The studies is taking it off. All right. Uh, he had seen that I was going to be here today, uh, but he needed to be elsewhere. Uh, but he's another wonderful resource for knowing about uh, about these things, as well as uh, some other fugitive Chicago mapping material. So with that, uh, please ask me any questions that I weren't prompted earlier. <laughs> I have a question. So the, the Sanborn, so were they regularly scheduled? Uh, so they had these interim corrections, but you know, I mean, can you predict there's one every so often when you're looking? No. no. Not there's not a pattern that I have ever discovered. Um, I suspect that it was uh, an as-needed kind of thing that they would assess how messy the office volume was getting and hey it's time for us to republish volume 16 which has had a tremendous amount of new houses built since 1921 the last time we did volume 16 things like that and um, 
it was volume by volume. And I think that's right. Oh, interesting. And how the subscriptions worked, I'm a little unclear on. There is some uh, interesting information that I've not completely read through at uh, that. You know, I showed that historic information gatherers website or FIMO, the fire insurance maps online. They have some stuff telling you how to use them, including that, that legend or that key that I put up as a couple of slides. But then there's some descriptive material more about how these things were made, how they were maintained that I've not read entirely through yet. So that, that may tell a little bit more about it, but I suspect it was largely um, just as they noticed that or had calls from subscribers that said, you know, uh, the northwest side of Chicago looks very different now than it did in 1890. Uh, maybe you should uh, do a new line out there. And, and they still exist? No. Sanborn seems to have existed as a cartography enterprise until at least the early 1980s. So there was a set of structure maps that they did for the city of Chicago. And I don't know which library has a complete set. I think UIC may. Uh, it's possible. I, will, I will try to remember to check if, if uh, UFC map library has a set. But uh, so th there was a set that just showed the building, the, the footprint of every building in the city of Chicago. And that was finished sometime around 1980, 79 or 80. That's the last things that I ever heard of them doing. Then when I worked at, uh, in this field in the 80s and 90s, occasionally there would be ads for them in the, uh, the Geomatics magazine or the GIS uh, publications saying, you know, if you want somebody to compile building footprints from the aerial photography, uh, we're in that business and we'll deliver it to you as GIS line work, shape files. We do, uh, today is the, by far the most common uh, you know, geojson uh, format for that use. So anyway, I think they existed as an independent company until sometime in the 80s. But eventually, the old stuff became more valuable than the new contracts that they were getting. And I think they were purchased by a company who's called Environmental Data, something or another, that was really trying to make money by mining these old maps for the people who were having to compile the property reports and rule out the uh, brownfield sites being Superfund sites. I was particularly curious because I'm looking along at urban renewal issues in, in Hyde Park, you know, uh, what, what was your what went, you know, what, you know and on a sort of granular level. So you know, it's like, you know. Uh, well, I'm, uh, there's some connections I, I might make with, uh, with you on that subject, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, something in the back of my head I, I want to dig a little more into the Department of Urban Renewal materials at uh, Harold Washington Library yeah, so they they to it. and I think there's a big chunk that went up into special collections yeah. rather than into uh, municipal reference right. collections but every time I read someone saying, oh, you know, the University of Illinois at Chicago wiped out an entire neighborhood. Uh, no, no, they didn't. The neighborhood was already, had already been torn down when it was offered to them. And so anyway, I want to go and find, I look through those records a little bit more. Very interesting to create some project around uh, documenting what was going on and what the work was doing. Structure was doing. Students, but also some of your maps from Carl's book kind of burned into my memory from uh, 
plotting a walking tour that we eventually did telling the stories of the fire. I would just love for you to talk a little bit about the work you did for Carl on that book and sort of anything that you found especially interesting in researching uh, the history of the fire specifically. Um, you brought up Crosby's Opera House, which is my single favorite <laughs> fire, so that was awesome. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, Carl came to me, uh, Professor Smith, he's emeritus from Northwestern, uh, came to me um, almost as soon as he had the contract to do the book, and uh, we began talking about maps for the book. And because I had done some some for the Encyclopedia of Chicago that did kind of break new ground, uh, there's one that shows how the, the Great Fire of Chicago was not a single wall of flame that just swept across, but instead it was something like a dozen different fires where huge firebrands, including big rafters, would be carried aloft hundreds of feet and then start new fires that would burn back. So that's one of the maps that I made for the Encyclopedia of Chicago. And I had hoped that we could do some new research into uh, some things related to the Great Chicago Fire and map that out. I really wanted to know, for instance, more about uh, where the fire co relief cottages ended up being built. And I wondered if that was a data set that we could manage to find somewhere and then geocode all those addresses and show uh, where the vacant lots were that people put there fire relief cottages are, things like that, or had a couple of other ideas. Um, you know, uh, uh, Carl <laughs> uh, has become a friend. I don't want to uh, uh, to be unkind, but in the end, the, the maps did not turn out to break any new ground. They were just a list of the places mentioned in the book, a narrative. And in some cases, there were some small challenges with trying to properly locate a specific thing, whether it was the gas works that uh, were the first thing on the east side of the riverbank to be uh, catching a blaze, or the exact size and shape of Crosby's Opera House, things like that. Um, but otherwise, um, there was nothing terribly groundbreaking or innovative about the mapping work that was done for that book. But the discovery of those fire insurance maps at the uh, Leventhal Center, because uh, Chicago History Museum only had a partial set, when I discovered those online, that was a great advance for me to be able to look up old house numbers, new house numbers, confirm that things were uh, exactly in this location as I mapped them out on the maps for the current book. So no real groundbreaking research, I'm afraid, when it comes to those maps. But uh, I did a lot of stuff for the encyclopedia that I was proud of. And I hope um, in, you know, in the next decade, uh, a revised encyclopedia may uh, offer the opportunity to do some more of that kind of work uh, because we have so many data sources that are now digitized and available to us, even things like old phone books. So yes. if we want to um, look up, you know, all the Chinese restaurants in Chicago or all of the, uh, the movie houses uh, and the things that we can do now that we could not do at 2002, just really wonderful. Has there ever been some like an old structure or anything like that that you found in a map that you just it was completely new and just sent you down a crazy rabbit hole of trying to dig up as much information about you know this new discovery as you could? Those panoramas are pretty cool. <laughs> the panoramas were cool, but I but I uh, I give a talk where I talk about them. But, uh, because of the way they show up in, there's an 1898 bird's eye view uh, where they're very common enough. Uh, and uh, so that was, uh, so I already knew about them from, from some years ago. Um, 
nothing immediately comes to mind. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's something I've stumbled across and uh, gone out to look at recently, but uh, you know, I, just nothing that immediately comes to mind. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> Say a cyclone <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but these kinds of uh, hidden tales of Chicago history uh, are on all kinds of maps, not just the fire insurance maps. So I have a talk that I, I give a lot at libraries, senior centers, the places like that, uh, called Cartographic Tales of Chicago History. And so they're hiding on street maps, on Thematic maps, government maps, even topo maps. So, what? <laughs> one that, um, uh, I, as I was looking back through my uh, Twitter uh, feed of things that I've responded to in the last two or three years, uh, having to do with fire insurance maps, uh, I remember the Chicago Half Orphan Asylum was a, a big institutional building that stood on, I believe it was Larrabee in the uh, Old Town until sometime probably in the early 80s. And it certainly shows up on old maps as well as people remembering walking by this thing that had a very odd name. But it turns out until the early 20th century, um, half orphans, people who were left only with you know, a mother or a father, um, that was a tough thing for people to, to care for their children because there was just not much of welfare or child support uh, at that time. And, uh, so it turns out the half orphan asylum first moved up uh, to the north side as part of uh, another school and then uh, turned into the institution we know as Chapin Hall, right down here in 1313 and 60th where I worked for many years in that building with Fort Chapin Hall. So, so. Thank you so much for the sense. This is awesome. And I'm going to the recording to share with students. <laughs> and yes, thank you. Great. Terrific. Nice to meet you.